this morning, I'm going to teach you a new word, one that my wife says that I should know how to use. It's sort of foreign, but I'm going to show it to you. You help me with it and see if we can get the pronunciation right, okay? Here we go. <laughs> I heard that word. I did too. <laughs> Yesterday, at about three minutes of five, Linda Mahar came to me and said, Richard, are you doing chapel in the morning? And I looked at her in that shocked look because I just read the Wednesday word on Wednesday, <laughs> and I was not on the list for at least a week. Now understand as I tell you my story that the barbers are not away from home every night of the week. In fact, we spend most evenings at home quietly. But yesterday, we actually got two invitations to go out and eat. We accepted the first one. The second one came later. We would have gladly gone with them too. And we've been going to... So we, we got invited to eat. We, we, we're going to go to Tim Peterson's ball game. Now, I've been to three of his ball games. I'm not sure if I'm bad luck or not, but we're going to see, stay away from tonight's game and see how he does. But uh, I like going to watch Tim play. Uh, he's a good kid, and, and he's been on our team. And so Peterson has invited us to go out and eat, and so we went out with him last night to eat. And so um, after we ate, we went to another couple's home just to stop for a moment and speak. And, and long story short, it was after 9 o'clock by the time I got home last night. Now, you all know me. I'm a planner. I like to have time to plan for my devotions and work and all the other things I do. And so here I am. I'm teaching a class for the pastors, uh, a pastor's school, and I'm up here doing devotions and all these things, and my wife says, you need to learn a new word. All right, so in the future, I probably will. I want to talk to you about work perspective. Last night I told you we had the opportunity to go out to dinner with, with Peterson's, and, and it was a good evening. I enjoyed it. We went to, to the restaurant, and they had brown placemats, white china. From my vantage point where I was sitting, uh, uh, there was a waterfall and green lights. You know where we're at? Arby's. I can see the car wash. <laughs> It's all about perspective. <laughs> it's all about perspective. What are you seeing? You know? Um, some of you have an allergy. Now, that's not always true, but some of you have an allergy when it comes to working outside and, and hard work and some of the things we do. And, and, and you don't like being outside with all of us guys outside. Now, if you talk to Mike and I and, and some of the others, I don't want your job. I don't want to be inside. It's called perspective. But you know, it's an amazing thing. You know when work began? At the very beginning. It's an amazing thing. There's work to be done. We need to be doing it. And uh, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 19, it says, Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them, and whatever Adam called each living creature, that was his name. One of the contributions of science is the naming of things. They find something, they observe it, they reflect on what they see, they describe it, and then they get to name it. If you remember in Genesis 1-5, God named day and night. But now he invites Adam, the world's first scientist, to participate in his work, giving him the responsibility of naming each creature. And right from the, right from the very beginning, God was, or Adam was occupied with the work of naming animals and caring for the garden. The Lord God placed a man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it in, in uh, Genesis 2.15. And so it shouldn't surprise us because... The Bible begins with God working. Work is a good gift from God, a reflection of his own character and his activity. It's important to note that Adam was never overwhelmed by his work while he was in the garden. Get that. 
He was never overwhelmed in the garden by his work. When did that happen? When did he start to be overwhelmed? It's when sin entered the world. And so work existed before sin entered the world. Work will continue after sin has been taken away. And Adam never knew what it was like to be frustrated with his work until after he was outside the garden. Now, I know things get frustrating from time to time. I get frustrated from time to time. When you run into a vehicle and put a big dent in the side, you can frustrate me. When you don't put your tools away, you can frustrate me. When I send you to do a job and you do it completely the opposite way from what I intended you to do. I won't tell you who did it, but I sent two young men out to Heavenly Street to put in new posts for the fence. You know what they did? They took off the top rail, drew, drove the new posts through the rusted post, and they were done. I never thought of that. Uh, unfortunately, frustration doesn't end with Adam. It's something we all need to be saved from sometime, from time to time. And God's saving purpose includes restoring us to a position from which Adam fell. And so that means that we can be master over our work instead of being mastered by our work. God brought the animals to Adam. That's what Scripture tells us. God took a personal interest in Adam's work. Sometimes it's hard for us to understand or to think about the worth of what we're doing. When you're sitting at your desk or you're laying on the shop floor under a car, putting a transmission in, or if you're in school, or maybe over at the kitchen sink, it's hard to think that God's taking a personal interest in those things. But he is. God enjoys the documents you prepare when you do your very best. He enjoys and appreciates the tests you take. He is amazed at the components you assemble at the homes you create. What we need to realize is that God cares about everything we do. And he wants us to do our very best. I was talking to Bob, or to Bob, to Doug and, and uh, Steve last night. Now, the only thing that would have been better last night at the meal would have been to have Mike there. And if you don't know that Mike and Steve and Doug are three of the most competitive individuals God has ever created on the earth, I'm telling you, that's the way it is. They can remember 13 years ago who won the quiz at Debrief. And so we were sitting there last night just, just talking about some of the things that we'd enjoyed and some of the things that God had done and some of the, the memories that we have and know that God cares about the work that we're doing. He cares about those things. He wants us to enjoy what we're doing. Now, I, I'm not telling I, I've been feeling a little stepped on in chapel. You know, uh, Mike said I've got to persevere. Rena says I've got to count things that make me aggravated as benefits. <laughs> And then Annie Russum says, I can't talk anymore. <laughs> but I know that God wants me to enjoy what I'm doing here at Teen Missions, that he wants me to enjoy uh, the labor. For me, it's the labor of my hands. I, I take great satisfaction in being able to complete a task. And I know that that pleases God. Now, there are days, like I said, when I get frustrated. There are days when I get irritated with the whole outfit and, and think, uh, why am I, you know, pushing against the, why am I pushing the truck uphill? You ever done that? And, uh, and yet I know that God wants me to be happy in what I'm doing. And so I have resolved, like I said, I've been feeling sort of stepped on. And so I'm going to resolve that I'm going to take great pleasure. And I do most of the time take great pleasure in what I'm doing, knowing that God wants me to be master over what I'm doing, not be mastered by it. Don't let Satan defeat you by making you think you're mastered by what you have to do. Thank you. Oh, I got it. Well, let, me, let me read my story. I almost forgot my story. This is a story I've used before, and I like this story. This sort of goes along with what I was saying. There's a woman who's been diagnosed, diagnosed with cancer. She's been given three months to live. 
Her doctor told her to start making preparations to die. Probably something we all should be doing. She contacted her pastor, had him come into her house to discuss the aspects of her final wishes. She told him which song she wanted sung at the service, what scripture she would like read, and what she wanted to be wearing. The woman told her pastor that she wanted to be buried with her favorite Bible. Everything was in order, and the pastor was preparing to leave when the wooden woman suddenly remembered something very important to her. There's one more thing she said excitedly. What's that? Came the pastor's reply. This is very important. I want to be buried with a fork in my right hand. The pastor stood looking at the woman, not knowing quite what to say. That shocks you, doesn't it? She said. Well, to be honest, I'm puzzled by the request, said the pastor. The woman explained, in all my years of attending church socials and functions where food was involved, my, my favorite part was when whoever was clearing the dishes of the main course would lean over and say, you can keep your fork. What they told me to keep, when they told me to keep my fork, I knew that something great was about to be given to me. It wasn't jello, it wasn't pudding, it was cake or pie. Something with substance. So I just want people to see me there in the casket with a fork in my hand, and I, then I want them to wonder what's with the fork. Then I want you to tell them something better is coming, so keep your fork too. The pastor's eyes welled up with tears. As he hugged the woman goodbye, he knew this would be the last time he'd see her before her death, but he also knew that the woman had a better grasp of heaven than he did. Something better is coming.